Michael is the chairman of the advisory board for Bloomberg New Energy Finance. He founded the company in 2004 and was later acquired by Bloomberg. He's a member of numerous energy industry groups, including the UN Secretary's General's High Level Advisor Group on Sustainable Energy for All. He sat on President Clinton's Global Initiative Energy and Climate Change Working Group. Michael is a Harvard Business School graduate um, and for the Stanford and um, Berkeley crowd here, I suppose, Michael, they can come take shots at you later. Um, but he strongly believes in green energy, very, very insightful. We are absolutely delighted to have you back, Michael. Thank you so much for taking the time to come out and see us. Michael Liebreich. Thanks very much. It's, a, it's an enormous pleasure and an honor uh, to be here. Um, <clears throat> when I spoke a couple of years ago, I likened this event to, um, you know, to being like, you've celebrated Christmas all your life, and then one day, you, you slide back some doors and you see, my goodness, the elves. <laughs> because this is the crowd that keep the lights on. You know, we all talk about it. Uh, we all use the power. We all, uh, talk, we all you know, uh, talking about the shift to clean energy. But here, this is the crowd that keep the lights on. This, you are the elves, and I, I respect that. Uh, what I could do um, while you eat and do keep eating um, is give you a few of the sort of international trends. You're engaged in this incredible journey here towards clean energy and transportation. Others are also around the world. And a couple of years ago, I think uh, you'd invited, uh, An Angelina and her colleagues had invited, um, I think that was the, the first time you'd brought internationals over, and, uh, uh, and, and that's a great tradition. Um, so I, that, was the, that was the impetus for me first to come here. But I'll give you some insight from around the world and maybe a few observations on some of the things going on here. Um, you have to forgive me if I don't, uh, if I don't make sense on those. So let's start with investment. Uh, we tracked all the investment in clean energy since 2004. Uh, and as you can see up there, uh, it's grown. It grew from the very early days, 60 billion uh, per year, up to around a third uh, of a trillion dollars per year. This is renewable energy, energy efficiency, uh, carbon capture and storage, even though there isn't any. Um, and. Um, uh, power storage. It doesn't include large hydro and gas and nuclear, and those are going to be part of all of our futures, and I'm not, I'm not discriminating against them. It just You get a nice signal to see whether the money is uh, accelerating or whether it's flattened out. And since I came two years ago uh, to speak to you, you can see that, broadly speaking, it has flattened. Those last two years are uh, still around the sort of third of a trillion dollars per year, and in fact, this year, we reckon it'll be about the same again. So you've now had, <coughs> pardon me, about eight years of the same level of investment year on year in this definition of clean energy. Now, during that time, the installations around the world of renewable energy have continued to go up. Uh, so we're now at about 160 gigawatts of installations per year. And you can kind of divide history, therefore, into two periods. It's very clear. There was a period where if you wanted more clean energy, you just spent more. Actually, you subsidized more. Um, but then there's this other period, which starts around 2011, where you spend the same, and you now get about double. And that's because of cost reductions. And we're in a de very different world in that second period than in the first period. Now, if you look around the world, you look at the international experience, though, it's been very variable, very different. Macroeconomics and political cycles really matter. So there you can see um, Europe, that's Asia Pacific, and that's the Americas. And we'll go into each of those a little bit. But you can see a very different shape in terms of uh, the financial flows. Europe starting early, then dropping away. Uh, Asia seeing this huge surge, now dropping. And America, it's very strange, America's doing this kind of, once every four years, it goes through a wave. What, what is the, I don't know, any, any ideas? Answers on a postcard. <clears throat> so this is Europe, and you can see there that incredible uh, surge. Europe was first out of the blocks with large-scale renewable energy. 
Um, you could argue that they started uh, too aggressively too soon when the costs were still um, too high, but certainly did us all a huge favor pushing down the costs of clean energy uh, through that surge of investment, which peaked around 2011. And you can see it's now bouncing along, maybe a little bit better the last couple of uh, quarters, but no major uh, resurgence. Europe is not getting back into a leadership position that it was in uh, in the early years. Uh, this is coal um, consumption by the top 10 coal consuming nations in Europe. I'm very proud to say there's only one which is really dismantling its coal at a great rate and that is the UK. The UK this year had 24-hour stretches with no coal consumption for the first time since the Industrial Revolution. So I like to look at this and say this is the future history of coal around the world. This is Germany. Now you have a great expert, much greater expert than me, on what's happening in Germany, Martin Schoeper, who will be speaking tomorrow. So uh, he's going to and explain uh, what's going on here. But there you can see Germany, the energie vendor we hear so much about, has built a lot of renewable energy, but has not shut the coal. So you can see power sector emissions in Germany have been, broadly speaking, flat for, around, uh, for more than 15 years. I think that's around uh, yeah, it's 18 years or so. So that's what's happening in Europe. We really need it to restart, to jump start a big uh, a big new wave of investment. We see signs of it in southern Europe. So Spain and Italy, the first projects being financed uh, very often without subsidies now. So it's starting, uh, but you can see um, not really uh, got the momentum you'd expect. <coughs> this is um, Asia. Uh, you can see, by the way, these are quarterly figures and the line is an annual uh, four quarter rolling uh, um, uh, total. And you can see that what happened in Asia for many years was quarter on quarter consistent growth, uh, driven by China, but also uh, Japan, also India. And then that kind of changed in 2015, largely because uh, China came off the boil and also Japan, having invested a lot after Fukushima, um, that slowed down. They were having problems integrating that much um, solar in Japan and both wind and solar in China. So if you look at China, on the left you can see its growth rate. Growth rate slows from those uh, incredible sort of years of 10%, 12% uh, GDP growth. That all slows down. And then on the right you can see thermal capacity factors dropping. We see that, by the way, everywhere in the world, thermal capacity factors dropping. But also, at the bottom, the dreaded word, curtailment. Uh, and you can see there are levels of curtailment of 10%, uh, even higher. Um, some of the provinces in China, they've got a real problem integrating the wind and solar that they have already built, and therefore the investment has slowed. In Japan, it's slowed because of the, the, the post-Fukushima boom has now turned to, um, I don't know what you want, what's the, what's the opposite of a boom? I can't remember the word. But anyway, it's slowed. Uh, but we are seeing growth in India, so that's the story in Asia. Uh, India there, the cost of solar power is now cheaper than coal. Uh, that's not some activist. Uh, that's uh, actually the minister of, uh, for power, coal, new and renewable energy and mines. So we're really seeing uh, a lot of Asian countries, not just uh, India, resetting their coal expansion plans. They all had these plans to uh, build enormous amounts of coal. Those are being reset and that is a trend that will continue. <coughs> So, the US, with its um, strange, inexplicable four-year uh, cycles, there's probably not a lot that I can tell you um, that you don't know already or that you're not watching more closely, um, but I'll, I'll give you some, perhaps some thoughts from somebody who's not US-based. Um, um, so, the US is pulling out of Paris. Um, we are almost sure, although we're not quite sure, because 
Uh, every so often you get this kind of confused, well, we're sort of pulling out, but we're not pulling out, but it's voluntary, but we're going to renegotiate, and we're not quite sure what that means. And, and you get these kind of mixed signals. Um, so the president being open to finding uh, conditions remaining. In, I don't quite know what this means, but uh, <coughs> I actually don't know how you can um, renegotiate a deal which is voluntary and still be uncertain about the outcome. But apparently that's where we are. Uh, and then we hear that there's been no change anyway. So uh, the, um, it's very difficult as a non-US, you know, sitting not in the US, to interpret all of this. Um, but the response pretty much at this stage is now this. What do you want us to do? And the world is continuing with its plans uh, to address climate change with the same vigor, perhaps even more so, as it had uh, at the end of the Paris um, discussions. Now, here in the US, we also observe the response domestically and are quite heartened by it. I don't know whether we should, whether we should be more or less heartened than we are, but you know, when you see we're still in, obviously led by uh, or contributed to by uh, one Mike Bloomberg, um, th this looks uh, pretty encouraging. And given the extent to which the levers of what happens in the energy system are not, don't sit within the Beltway in Washington, you can be quite encouraged by this. Uh, and my sense is probably that the US will hit its Paris targets irrespective of what happens uh, in the White House. So I think you're probably still on track and probably the people in this room are going to have more impact on that uh, than, than anybody else. But clearly, you know, it's a very, it, the news flow is, is very um, uh, troubling. Um, and um, the, you know, we observe the, uh, the recent um, notice of um, proposed rulemaking. Um, and I'm a bit handicapped, I can't see the first words on this, but it's particularly urgent uh, to prevent premature retirement of the resources that have these critical attributes. And the critical attributes, apparently, as far as I can see, are huge piles of coal. Um, but um, it's very hard to see this actually making much difference, perhaps outside the PJM markets, where that really could, be a, uh, could have a, def a decisive uh, effect on keeping coal plants from shutting. I don't think it's going to be enough to get anybody to actually build a coal plant. Does anybody know of anybody who's going to build a coal plant in order to benefit from this potential change to a rule which might last however many years, maybe. Uh, I don't think we have of, of anybody. Um, because the Perry review, the first thing they did when he came into office was review um, the impact of variable renewables. Uh, and there you see the coal um, coming out of the mix. Uh, you see other sources, natural gas and renewables growing. And of course, um, we. Bloomberg New Energy Finance at our summit in uh, New York in April concluded that really what was happening was the economics of cheap uh, natural gas, cheap renewables, and cheap energy efficiency was what was pushing coal. It was nothing to do with a war on coal. And lo and behold, uh, that was also pretty much the finding of the review. So not surprising then uh, that, that, um, that, that we see continuing uh, shutdown of coal resources uh, and indeed um, in, we've just seen the announcement, I think it was last week, of um, luminance closures in Texas. That's about four gigawatts of coal, some huge proportion of the coal in Texas. Uh, obviously, ERCOT, the closest thing to um, an independent nation's uh, electrical system that you've got uh, here. Uh, and that's the answer, really. That is the response. That's the correct response uh, based on economics to the uh, make America great again uh, coal, you know, push to get back onto coal. The um, slightly more troubling, though, is the um, Seneva case, because um, obviously very little of the solar capacity manufactured here in the US, and so pushing up the, the, the cost of that capacity, the cost of that technology, could be very negative. And what we've got here is just our estimate of what it might do to uh, the price of solar power. And you see a number of scenarios there. Free market is sort of where we are over on the, the left. Um, and then, obviously, buying Chinese 
cells and modules over on the right, if there's a finding and if it goes through that, uh, that there'll be a tariff, um, the cell tariff placed on imports, then you'd look um, like it is over on the, on the right there. So in other words, cents per watt would go from 30 to somewhere north of 70, and that would have a big, big uh, negative impact on the uh, speed of rollout of solar. Nevertheless, moving manufacturing to the US uh, although there would be a, uh, a penalty in cost terms, uh, depending on whether it's cells or modules, it'll be around 10 or 20 percent. And if you then wash that through the percentage of a project's cost, which is the actual panel, um, that's probably, I don't want to say it uh, could easily be absorbed, but it's, it's going to slow things down, but not as dramatically as the, as the scenarios over on the right. So obviously we're all watching this. Uh, and it's not a good thing, and it's very annoying, um, uh, and, and, but it's something that the industry is most likely, in some way, shape, or form, going to ride through. Taking a look at the background economics, how can you ride through that sort of a disruption? Uh, when I spoke here uh, two years ago, these were the record prices anywhere in the world for renewable uh, energy. Um, you've got there 5.84 cents for solar, 4.5 cents uh, plus or minus for onshore wind, and offshore wind, 12 cents per kilowatt hour. One year later, 2.7 cents for solar, 3 cents for onshore wind, 5.3 US cents for offshore wind, and now the world records anywhere uh, anywhere in the world for these technologies, under two cents for solar and onshore wind, and under five cents for offshore wind. In other words, in the two years since I last spoke here, the world record price has more than halved in each of those technologies. What the world record obviously is the, you know, that's the best project with the lowest risk, but what we've seen time and again is that that record price becomes the median price pretty darn quickly, uh, within, a, within a few years. So if you're not planning for two cent wind, two cent solar, these are the unsubsidized prices, uh, then uh, you're probably, you know, you're, you're not on the, uh, on the money. We all know experience curves, that's what's been driving it. We've actually recalculated. Um, we've got a 19% experience learning rate for wind, 24 to 28% for solar. You'll see that we also do them for electric vehicles, for batteries, not just for electric vehicles, but all batteries. And the learning rates are similar, around 20%. So every time you double the cumulative uh, installed capacity, you get a cost reduction of around 20%, a bit more for solar, a bit less for wind. And that's not going to stop. That will continue. It's worth the wind, it's worth looking at um, exactly, you know, what does that physically look like? Here you've got uh, 2005, just after I'd started New Energy Finance, four megawatts was the biggest wind turbine in the world. And it was about as high, I'm afraid these are European buildings you've got here, about as high as the London Eye, for those of you who've been, if not, try it. Um, that's the Gherkin, also in London, seven megawatts. That's the Eiffel Tower, nine megawatts. And that's the Shard, the tallest building in London, uh, the next generation of offshore wind that will be built that will cost around five US cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, the, these, these are absolute monsters, these turbines. Um, my mother doesn't really know what I do. Um, so I showed her this, and she said, that's amazing, that's absolutely incredible. Why would you build one in front of the Shard? <laughs> <laughs> now, what that's going to do, what these costs are going to do, we are more bullish than all of the big official forecasters, IEA, EIA, all of the oil companies, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason is that there are tipping points involved. We are currently in the middle of tipping point one, which is where... If you need incremental power, right? so in the developed world that's tough because we've not got power demand growing, but we've got retirement. So if you need to build new source of electrical power, then renewables in almost every country in the world is the cheapest way of doing it. So all incremental power now, the first place you look is renewables, not the last place anymore, the first place. But there's another tipping point coming. And that's where new versus existing. In other words, 
you're happily running a fossil fuel power station, coal or gas, you should actually shut it and build new renewables because it's so cheap. And that's coming down the track at us, different countries, different times, 2025, 2030. But absolutely, everywhere in the world, almost as far as we know, everywhere in the world, by 2040, you shut fossil wherever you can and you build new renewables. And that drives, obviously, very deep penetrations of renewables into the system. There you can see, in terms of what's uh, going to be required from an investor point of view, uh, $10 trillion on the electricity generating side worldwide between today and 2040, of which more than $6 trillion will go to wind and solar. We've got some nuclear in there, uh, but that will depend on next generation technologies and all sorts of political considerations. Gas, there will be gas, but gas will not play the role of bulk energy supply. Gas will be all about balancing and not about bulk supply because it will be more expensive than those renewable sources. So if you can meet demand from renewables, you will. If you can't, you'll have to go to something else. Gas will be one of those things. The coal comes out, you see there the black is coal, leaving the system, some gas growth, but the age of gas that was promised, that we all heard about, is not going to happen. It's going to be gas as a source of flexibility. And it won't be the fastest growing source of flexibility. That will be everything else. Two years ago I talked about the sort of dispatch curve of flexibility. Software is always cheaper than kit. Bits are cheaper than kit. So you'll see demand response, and then you'll see power storage and other things coming in, and the growth rates there will be faster than the growth rates for gas. So where are we now? We've got these very deep penetrations in major economies of renewable energy. Germany, 29%. UK, 25%. That's out of date. This year, so far, it's already been over 30. I think it's 35. Um, and we see this state by state. You all know the figures uh, for your own states, for California or the other states that you all come from. Um, Deep penetration of renewable energy in major economies is now happening, and it's changing pricing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what we also see is these are variable resources, and we now see some very substantial figures for maximum renewable generation in any given day. And you can see there Scotland 153%, Denmark 140%, uh, you've got um, Germany 67%. So on a, in terms of managing a grid, which is the business a lot of you are in, this is much harder than just saying, oh, it's at 25%. No, it's, it might be at 150% and then at almost zero the next day. So you've got to manage that uh, intermittency. And you can see there, Kaiso and, and ERCOT, and they're probably more up-to-date records even than that. And that is going to drive the investment profile. The renewables will be cheap, but dealing with this may not be cheap. And that's the big challenge we all face. It changes the nature of supply. We've done this work. Uh, we started here. You can see this is Germany. Uh, that's what the past used to look like. Very simple. You had your base load. You had your peak. And it was a pretty easy life. Now it looks like this in Germany. In the winter, lots of wind, but almost no solar. In the summer, regular solar and some wind. Your system has to deal with winter and summer. But go out into the future, this is around 2040, and it starts to look like this. Look at those bits where it pokes out below. That's either curtailed or exported. And there's almost, there is no base load. You still need some fossil, that's the black bits on the, at the top. You still need some fossil to keep the whole thing going, but there's no base load, none. Now, I didn't have the time or resources to do uh, the same exercise as this for Kaiso area, for California. Um, I don't know, C Cody, Cody from LS Power helped me out here. I don't know if he's in the room. He should be. He said he would be. But um, he helped me to put together this. This is California. Go back to 2012. Uh, the blue is the traditional. Then you've got, you can see a little bit of solar and wind at the top. That's today and causes problems already. You've already got the shift to the, these strange you know, dual peaks and the peak in the afternoon and so on. 
And I just thought it would be really interesting to have a look at what 2030 looks like if the IRP that's currently under discussion goes through. Just model it out and see what it looks like. Well, it looks like that. Clearly no more base load. Huge ramp rates every day. All of that solar coming in and going out. And then, of course, you need a lot of demand response storage and export, regionalization, or curtailment, or large-scale curtailment is going to happen. Now, I don't know, you've all gone very quiet, so maybe this is all sort of because you know this, uh, and you're thinking, why is this guy rabbiting on, and we did this years ago, and so on. But this, this is a, for me, this is a very visual representation of the challenge uh, that you face. And uh, I'm sure that there are people who've modeled this in much more detail than, well, than I could, probably maybe Cody can, uh, could, could speak for how much detail he, he put into it. But I suspect that the amount of demand response, storage, and the exportability that are in the current plans is probably not enough to run this system. Right? Now, it will be in due course, because you've got phenomenal strength and, and depth of field here in the room. But that's what I would be uh, thinking about very, uh, very hard, very deeply. Now, one of the things, there's two things I'm going to talk about, finally, that will help with uh, managing that. And the first is vehicles and electrification. Um, we're very bullish about electric vehicles. I think I spoke about this two years ago. I thought I'd show you this. This is 2008. If you wanted to buy an electric car, you had the choice of one. Well, that's not strictly true. You could buy a golf buggy. Um, but if you wanted a proper car, then it was a Tesla Roadster. Um, 2010, 11, 12, as you roll forwards in time, and what we're seeing is the full range of vehicles from sports cars, sedans, SUVs, vans. What this graphic doesn't show, it doesn't show models that will be sold in India or China. It has not kept up with the number of models that are being launched, GM, Volkswagen, Volvo, et cetera, et cetera. There are more and more of these almost every week being announced. It also doesn't include freight. It's got some small vans, but it doesn't include uh, what's happening across the commercial vehicle industry, which is designing electric versions of larger and larger trucks. Obviously, there's the Tesla that's going to be announced, that's going to be announced, that's going to be announced. Um, but there are others. And I do a lot of work now on transportation, more than on energy. There is not a manufacturer who's not on board with this. Why? Well, one of the main reasons is our old friend, the experience curve. Right now, 2016, 2017, we're talking about prices for an EV battery pack of about $250 per uh, kilowatt hour. That will go down by 2030, we say, to $73. Right? So it's going to go down by more than a factor of three. And you get people saying, oh, you can't do that. It's chemistry. And those are the same people who said that you couldn't do it with, uh, with solar because it was chemistry, or it was this, that, and the other, and so on. Um, so we've done this top-down experience curve and also bottom-up, looking at all of the different components and how you pack them together and how you scale up manufacturing, and critically, the cost of capital. All of this is capital goods. The cost of capital comes down as investors get comfortable. And I would say, you know, 73, I think top-down we came to 85 or something, but that's the sort of price point we're going to get to. And what that means is that the sticker price, not total cost of ownership, the sticker price of an electric vehicle anywhere in the world, depending on whether it's a, a, a small car, a hatchback, or a big, or with a short distance, or an SUV, or whatever, that sticker price is going to cross over with internal combustion vehicle sometime between 2025 and 2029. And it'll simply be cheaper. Sticker price, much cheaper if you consider fuel, particularly obviously in countries where there's fuel tax. Um, so we're going to see this completely flip, the economics. What we've seen from Norway, Norway does it through taxation, but what we see is that when these vehicles become cheaper, they fly out of the showroom because they're better vehicles. 
Uh, so this is very helpful for you as you think about your grid because you don't have to buy the batteries and just have them sitting there making sure that the grid doesn't fall over. You, have the, you can manage that charging intelligently. The corollary or the sting in the tail is if you do not do that, if you don't manage that intelligently, you're in really big trouble. Because if you let people come home from work and plug in their car and turn on the air conditioning and put the kettle on and go and check Facebook, right? then your peak is going to be much worse, much, much worse, because this is a serious power requirement here. So you have got to have a solution to that that smears and spreads the demand throughout the day. And that solution will be infrastructure, and it will be software, and it will be some social um, you know, habits that, that develop and so on, and time of use pricing. And you need to use the full orchestra to achieve that, or you will be in trouble. Um, so that's our forecast for the numbers of cars, 54% of new cars worldwide. 33% of the fleet of cars by 2040. Uh, every time we do this, every year, uh, we've been, um, we've been uh, increasing those figures because you know, countries keep saying they're going to do this, that, and the other, and car companies also with their, all of their announcements. So this, uh, I'm pretty comfortable that this, is a, uh, uh, this will be the floor that it's likely to increase again. The second thing that's happening, I said that we were going to, there will be two things that will help you in, this, in the challenge of transitioning to deep, deep renewables. First was vehicles, and the second is software in all of its forms. Um, what you've got here is um, uh, some of the, the Internet of Things players and what they're doing. And obviously you can see there's some broad platform players, some very big companies, the kind of the Cisco's, the IBM's, uh, the GE's. And then you go all the way down to some much more specific players who are working on either transportation or energy. Um, there's a keep trucking, open energy, doing very interesting things, Newell. And there's a whole bunch of companies working on the Internet of Things and bringing intelligence to it. We have seen nothing yet. We've been talking about this for about uh, seven or eight years. But the digitization has to be pervasive before you can really use it to optimize. And that is now starting, and it's accelerating, and it's our friend. Here you can see some of the investments made by major companies. You won't be able to read this, but you can get copies of the slides. But you see really significant companies pairing up with some of the most innovative uh, startups on the planet. So you see combinations of Siemens and Eon uh, and Centrica and Total and, and uh, Angie in, in France. And they're investing in small companies around, the, you've got on the left you've got smart grid, uh, on the right uh, you've got home energy management. Um, but the, there is the whole area of machine learning um, that is about to open up and make our lives uh, easier. Um, so at the moment, digitization has been, in a sense, silos, pieces of digitization, electric vehicles or batteries uh, uh, within the energy and transport system. We're about to go into an era of connecting and using really large-scale uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, also peer-to-peer uh, -peer payment, the blockchain, um, some of the, putting intelligence into the edge of the system, DERMS, there's all sorts of acronyms here. Uh, we have only just started this, and the next, uh, well, any number of decades are going to be characterized by progress here. So a huge challenge, that journey you're on, very challenging to get renewables uh, up to the sort of 50 percent, 60, 70, 80 percent uh, that you've all uh, decided to do. Very, very challenging. Will it be hard? Absolutely. Would it be easier if the captain of your team was playing on the same side as you? It certainly would. But anybody who thinks that this can't be done or anybody who bets against um, US or Californian ingenuity to get this done, I think is making a very, very grave mistake. Thank you for having me here, and I'll hand back to our host. Thank you.